An emergency number here to call if you're worried about relatives in the United States. It is 0207 008 0000. That is 0207 008 0000. It's just after half past nine. You're watching a special edition of Channel 4 News on the day terror was wrought in America. A reminder of what happened early this morning. Two hijacked passenger jets smashed into both towers of New York's World Trade Center. As office workers fled for their lives, the entire edifice collapsed, sending rubble crashing throughout lower Manhattan. No one knows how many people were killed. How many injured? In Washington, D.C., the nation's capital, another hijacked jet smashed into the Pentagon. A fourth hijacked airliner had, had crashed in flames in Pennsylvania, thought to be targeted at Camp David in neighboring Maryland. So what went wrong with America's airport security that allowed four planes to be seized across the United States? Julian Rush looks now at how just such a precisely planned attack on the heart of American finance politics and military power could possibly have been carried out. Even as America reels, the questions begin. The terrorists' targets were well chosen. The Twin Towers, symbols of the American dream, of America's wealth and economic global domination. Symbols, it turns out, that were uniquely vulnerable. Remember, each tower is 110 floors. Maximum population, a staggering 50,000 people. What were the evacuation plans for so many? Just how do you fight a fire 400 metres above the street? And no skyscraper was ever designed to withstand this. The combination of the impact of tons of plane and the explosion of the fuel aboard, a fatal blow to the concrete and steel structures. Impossible, say engineers, to design a building to survive that. What's interesting is that the building withstood the plane impact but it's a subsequent fire. The fuel would have poured through the building and, and ignited, and as you see, as you see in the film, set fire to the building. And as that fire took hold, the steel structures of the buildings got hot. Um, they softened as they got hot, and the building just basically couldn't support the, the weight of the, the, of the floors above it. And they just then collapsed down, and the whole building you know, unfolded, as you see in the pictures, like a pack of cards, just collapsing in a surreal way. And it seems it was all too easy for the hijackers to get on board. For internal air travel in America, it's just like catching a bus. Security checks are very few. There's been concern for some time that civil aviation in the US is insecure. Um, it's not possible to check all passengers on flight. It's not possible to close all of air, all airspace over sensitive areas. So there certainly have been advocates in the US security community saying that this is a disaster waiting to happen because US uh, domestic airlines are so easy to hijack. And unfortunately, they may well now have been proved right. Above all, it's the precision planning of this operation that strikes you. Four aircraft hijacked within an hour, all carefully chosen, each flight headed from east coast to west, each with full fuel tanks so soon after takeoff. All hijacked close to their targets, giving little time for, say, the US Air Force to scramble. But then they wouldn't for a simple hijack when policy is to get them down safely and negotiate. Preparation must have taken months, which means surely there must have been intelligence failings. Why did no one know? The USA has the world's biggest intelligence operation. It spends billions on high and low tech surveillance. George Bush thought attacks from rogue states would come from missiles. Son of Star Wars is impotent against hijacked commercial jets. The US has stopped various attacks like this in the past. Um, there's several times they've stopped audacious attempts like this at the last minute or through intelligence operations uh, or indeed through preemptive arrests or preemptive strikes. But the point is with terrorism, as the IRA once said, terrorists only need to be lucky once. Uh, the security forces need to be lucky a hundred times. And what if, like the Oklahoma City bomb, it turns out to be the work of maverick militias and not connected to the Middle East at all? America was convulsed by introspective self-examination when Timothy McVeigh planted his bomb. It's a scenario American citizens must surely find too awful to contemplate.
Julian Rush, and we will, of course, bring you any more news from the United States as we get it. But let's now stand back from those horrendous scenes and talk about the impact on anti-terrorist measures worldwide on George Bush and on the American psyche. Uh, General Sir Michael Rose, who commanded the UN Protection Force in Bosnia, is in Bristol. In the studio here is documentary maker Gwyn Roberts, one of the rare uh, people who have actually met Osama bin Laden. Our U.S. correspondent David Smith is in San Francisco. Now, David, let's just start with you. Um, I suppose it is too early for people to be very precisely pointing the finger, uh, but uh, are people beginning to sort of ruminate as to who's done this? Oh, I think, John, from first thing this morning, it's obvious that the, the people around the president, uh, their initial suspicion has to be the Middle East. I spoke to somebody at the State Department as he was being evacuated from the building, somebody who's been in successive administrations for over 20 years. Osama bin Laden, yes, of course, in Afghanistan, but equally his response was, this is the kind of coordinated nexus of groups working together that would suggest that there were a panoply of them, and therefore a response is going to be that much more complicated because you're not looking, in their view at this stage, you're not looking at one man working from terrorist bases somewhere in Afghanistan. You are looking at an umbrella of groups coming together to pull something like this off. As the previous report pointed out, John, all these planes heading from east to west, one coming here to San Francisco, all of them heading east to, east to west precisely because they were large. They were 757, 767s loaded with the kind of fuel that would cause the kind of horrific damage we're seeing in New York and right. we will see I'm sure when the pictures come in from Pennsylvania and elsewhere. David stand by for a moment because I want to bring some others in. Let's go now uh, to uh, the BBC World Service building Bush House and talk to Fred Halliday, Professor Fred Halliday. Um, uh, Fred Halliday, do, do, do you have a kind of inner sense of who had the capability to do this? Well, there's three candidates. There's homegrown American crazies who certainly know how to fly planes and get into airports. There's Osama bin Laden, as people have said, probably with help from people in Pakistan at what level of government one can't tell, but there are plenty of people in Pakistan who know how to fly American planes. Thirdly, it could be Saddam, who's been recruiting Islamists to do some of his work recently, although I think it would be counterproductive for him. But we have to wait and see, and we've seen people rushing to judgment in the past over Oklahoma or TWA 800. We'll have to wait for the evidence. This is um, truly the most sophisticated terrorist attack, even well, well beyond the coordinated attacks on American embassies in Africa. Um, I mean, you presumably have never seen anything like it. I've never seen anything like it, but I think it's a bit like what some nuclear scientists said about the nuclear bomb. The biggest secret is you can do it. It may not have involved such a high level of sophistication. We don't know. It, but the main lesson of today is you can do it. You can hijack these planes, you can coordinate them, you can attack these buildings, and you're going to kill t tens or at least m many thousands of people. I think that's the biggest secret, and the, and the solution, the secret of that is very simple. If you've got the will to do it, you're willing to die, you can do it. I'll come back to you in a moment, uh, Professor Halliday. Um, Gwen Roberts, already two of our speakers have mentioned Osama bin Laden. You've met him, you've made a documentary about him. Uh, there are a lot of people do not know who he is. A very quick thumbnail sketch. He's highly intelligent. Um, he's very quietly spoken. He talks with a sort of biblical turn of phrase. But I have to say, when I met him, I didn't think that his organization could have had the, the sort level of expertise necessary to carry out this, uh, this attack. But he has networks. He certainly has networks. These exist as cells all over uh, the Middle East in particular. Uh, I spent a lot of time in northern Iraq. Uh, he was, his representatives were trying to contact Islamic groups there. Uh, there was also a lot of talk, I may say, at that time of contacts between the uh, Iraqi uh, government intelligence networks, the Muhabarat, and Osama bin Laden's group, contacts which seemed to have begun uh, when he was in, uh, in Sudan, which was so quite close to Iraq. Yeah. You don't rule it out, but you, you, you have a scepticism about his personal capacity to plot and lead such a thing. I, I feel that, um, uh, I mean, I spent a few hours with him, so uh, what I say has opened the question, but I felt that... Um, <laughs> that he, his group was visited by various um, uh, commanders from all over the Arab world. They, there's a loose coordination of these cell structures, but I just wonder how, how, 
you know, whether it really is that effective in controlling a super efficient uh, operation like today.